Hello my friends and welcome to Fishtory. I'm Alexander Williamson, your host as always, and this is a true episode of Fishtory. Well, not that the other ones are false, but this is an episode that is audio based, like the original iteration of Fishtory. And that means we are on episode 207. So this is a form of the show where we talk about fish, news, science, hobby and freshwater ecology news, science, and research, and recently discovered species or recently published papers, and uh, you can just kick back, you can do your water change, you can drive to work, or you can watch if you'd like, but no watching is required, there's nothing on the screen that is uh, so precious that you need to see it. So, let's jump right in today with Danios and drugs. Okay, there goes the monetization on this one. Well, it turns out that researchers wanted to give the beautiful little zebra Danio some ketamine. And ketamine is a horse and animal tranquilizer, generally speaking. And I want to say for whoever may review this video, I am not in any way advocating the use of any of these chemicals or Fish, don't don't even keep zebra Danios. I mean, anything about this, just don't just don't do it. Uh, and also, it's just educational. We're just talking about newly published research. So, hope that covers uh, everything. All right. So, humans have dealt with depression, and of course, always people have gotten sad. But at least since the 1800s, melancholia or Depression has been a medical disorder that is recognized and is seen as something like a long-lasting, you can't shake it, may not have a logical reason, it's not really triggered by uh, any sort of, uh, you know, death or major grievance. It may be completely nonsensical and you just don't even want to get out of bed. It's just this crushing, overwhelming feeling of doom and gloom and uh, it can be very adverse to your health, of course. But they have been researching for almost as long how to understand this condition and what triggers it, as well as how we can fix depression. So, back to the fish and the ketamine. Well, humans have been infusing ketamine into themselves uh, for surgical procedures for quite some time, over 60 years, and the FDA at one point approved the medication for use in anesthesia as well as in uh, basically um, while you're awake doing surgery that's localized or that is minor where they can numb or nerve block part of it and they need you awake for part of it in order to show that it's functioning. Um, there's also some cases of like brain surgery where this is required and it is a very interesting and novel compound in that it is used as a sedative and anesthetic and it will put humans and mammals unconscious and it will make them very, very uh, forgetful of any memories and also disassociate. So it's technically uh, a psychedelic disassociative and they have tried it on zebra danios. And the fascinating thing about why they did this and you may be thinking, well, okay, so if you were just saying they're looking at treating humans with this stuff for putting them under for surgery, well, okay, so when they put people under for surgery, it turns out some of them came out feeling like their outlook on life in the world had completely changed. Also, people who were illegally using this or doctors who had used it off-label for doing multiple medical procedures. So they may not have been using it in the way outlined by you know the guidebook per se, but it wasn't in a harmful way. They were just using it for a purpose other than is directly outlined, which is to basically knock you out and or to not make you feel or remember surgical procedures. Well, it turns out it works on animals, and it works on uh, mammals, obviously. It was, for years, used for, you know, all sorts of large animals, cows, pigs, goats, horses, and even elephants and things like this, because of its power. Now, milligram for milligram may not have the most power in the world, but it does have some really interesting properties. And, like I was saying, 
when they were using it on humans, there were these long lost kind of forgotten studies in the 60s and 70s of people using it and coming out of surgery feeling optimistic or no longer feeling depressed when they'd had years of depression. So over the last uh, decade or so, maybe 15 years, there have been ketamine infusion and as well as ketamine exposure therapy trials in humans going on. And basically that's exposing humans who are either depressed, uh, anxious, or in a lot of pain. So we're going to be talking, we're not going to go into the pain part today, we're going to be talking specifically about the people who are depressed and or anxious, which is really two sides of the same coin. They have to do with serotonin uptake uh, and uh, dopamine and, you know, a bunch of uh, neuroepinephrine and different neurotransmitters at the end of the day, uh, regardless of if they're momentary or long-lasting. But the long-lasting kind seems to get into kind of a feedback loop where it just keeps going in the person's brain and nothing can quite shake it. Well, they thought, you know, we've got these old reports that it helps people who are depressed possibly or shakes them up free of it for a while. So let's try infusing people with cancer or like terminal illness. And they started there and saw really promising um, improvements. So then they moved to people who were just very, very depressed and at high risk of uh, unaliving themselves. And then they have now moved on to whole other groups. But it has been kind of a mystery how all of this works. And there is the understanding of, you know, GABA receptors and what's going on with neurotransmitters to some degree and maybe what's going on with the conscious brain versus the unconscious brain and, uh, you know, a lot of conjecture of what is going on under the effects of ketamine. But thanks to our friend, the little zebra Danio, we are now able to peer into the actual active brain of a vertebrae. So... A vertebrae being a fish with a spinal cord, obviously, and, well, a brain, too. Uh, so this brain, <clears throat> we can see through the skin of the fish, and they breed specific groups of zebrafish, as well as a number of other uh, common fish, like rice fish, that are in the aquarium hobby, goldfish as well. And they will breed them with translucent skin. Now, they may already have this trait somewhat, but they breed it to the max, so they can actually see through the thin uh, cartilaginous skull casing and down into the brain. And with Danianella species, which are not what we're talking about in this study, but they're a very close relative of Danios, zebra Danios, but just smaller, they actually don't need to even breed them special or anything like that. They can see their brain perfectly clear right through their skin because they have such thin cartilage and that it's translucent. But with these fish that are the Danios that do have the brain and it is in a case of cartilaginous protection and then there's some tissue above it, they get that translucent tissue and then what they do is they take different dyes and they'll use different dyes to watch different tissue uh, working. They'll also use things like chemical reactions and genetically modified markers. So they'll do things like you see in the glowfish, where a fish is bright pink. Well, that started in the lab because they needed a way to, for instance, identify cancer cells. So they infused a type of cancer cell that was in a type of rat or a type of zebra daniel or whatever lab animal they're studying, and they made it so that when they shine a UV light on it, it will glow pink or green or whatever it may be. Well, they can do this also with various tissues based on whichever genes cause those tissues to be created or expressed, or sometimes even just by creating the correct chemical reaction with that existing tissue. So it's kind of like the baking soda and vinegar experiment where you put them together and it foams up. Uh, you can make a little volcano, if you will, when you're in elementary school and you add the vinegar to the baking soda at the bottom of your paper mache volcano and it reacts and poof. Well, instead of going poof, it just glows in the dark. Uh, and that, or under UV light, or maybe it just lights up, period, a different color. And so these are all different methods and, and different ways that they are able to look into the brain. And if it's a clear brain, they can do MRIs 
uh, CT scans, x-rays, and they can just look under a microscope and watch the brain thinking as it's doing things. They can see what part of the brain is lit up by watching for electricity and or uh, electromagnetic difference, differences in uh, the, mag the magnetic field around the brain. Then they can know, oh, there's a disturbance to the left here and there's pulses coming from here. So there's all sorts of equipment they can use, and you've probably seen those funny caps that they put on people, and they plug the things in, they put the gel on your head, sometimes they shave your head. Uh, anyhow, those are measuring like brain waves or electricity or impulses, things like that. And then in conjunction with MRIs, they can also see what part of the brain has the most blood in it or has the most neurons firing by other methods. And so, in this case, they looked at the zebra daniels and the ketamine, and you may be asking yourself, Alex, you're going on and on, but you haven't talked about, like, how do you get a depressed zebra daniel? And that's what's fascinating. So, fish, it turns out, this study pretty much admits fish get depressed too, and it's not the same as human depression necessarily. Well, it may be. We don't know. We're assuming they do not have the cognitive complexity to be depressed like a human and ponder the existential crises in their life. But they do share something with depressed humans, and that is that the same exact parts of their brain give up and no longer will keep trying to do a task that seems futile to them. So if you give someone who's not depressed a task of hammer this nail in, and it's in really, really hard wood, and the whole point was you're never going to get that nail hammered in. The person who's healthy and who is not depressed in any way will keep hammering for like five to ten times longer than the depressed person. The depressed person will give up and just, this is pointless, why would I do this? And, you know, there's evolutionary reasons why that kind of makes sense as one of the points of where depression comes from would be the will to uh, continue or the will to do difficult things without reward, that is a feedback loop in the brain that every once in a while you get huge rewards for it and then you get a big release of dopamine or serotonin and your brain is like, yay, I did something, right? You figure out a puzzle or you figure out a big equation or something you've been trying to plan for a long time and it finally clicks in your brain like, aha, I've got it. Well, this same drive goes on in a much simpler way in fish, just about swimming against the current. So the same exact parts of the brain actually respond to stimuli in a fish tank. And when they have a current that's turned up so fast that the fish can't swim against it, in fact, it will push them downstream to the back of the tank and literally push them against the tank. And they eventually, if they don't keep swimming and keep moving and everything, their gills will get p pushed shut and they can they could drown, uh, drowned underwater, you know, just like we would because they're not getting that oxygen through the gills and they've given up that much. And unfortunately, uh, that can happen and they've witnessed this happen in fish. They've witnessed this happen in those danios. So they engineered a set of these danios to basically uh, swim in a current that is very difficult to swim in. And they gave some of them ketamine, and they gave some of them nothing, and then they gave some of them uh, basically cortical steroid related compounds, or the stuff that you feel in your body when you're stressed, when you're mad, when you're frustrated. It's after you've given up. It's the reason you give up when your blood pressure is high and you're like, man, I couldn't get that nail in the board. That whole thing was a trick. I'm so frustrated. Well, that is where we see that, but we also see it with physical exertion. We see it in animals when they're trying to spawn or mate and they're unsuccessful or they're working at it and they haven't quite gotten it yet. And we also see it when people get hungry, it, these things rise. When people are in pain, these things rise. And so just like physical pain, mental pain actually triggers your brain to say, I am in pain, I want to give up. And in these fish, they were able to time how long a natural fish, a natural zebra fish, would swim against this current before they would give up and go and get flattened against the back of the tank. Now, they were kind enough, at least, to not drown the fish in this experiment. But then they gave them ketamine, and it turns out that they actually keep swimming for far longer, four times longer, before that signal in the brain says, hey, 
You're not getting anywhere. Give up. And it is likely that these same pathways in the brain that humans get stuck with, where you're feeling stuck, you're feeling like you don't want to try, can't get out of bed, those kind of uh, emotions, they are probably a very deep-rooted, primal, evolutionary survival tactic. And also in the sense that when they gave them the stress factor that made them already angry, they would swim harder at first against the current, and then they would give up quicker than both other groups. So you've got the three groups. The normal group, which let's just call it 10 minutes, swam 10 minutes against the current when they tried that. Then there's the next group, which had the ketamine, and they swam for 40 minutes before they gave up and got pushed back by the current, and they realized it was futile and they should give up. Then there were the ones that were given corticosteroids and cortisone and other things that uh, caused them to feel frustration, anger, and basically uh, stress, stress hormones. And those ones had more fight right at the moment, maybe for four minutes or three minutes. Then they got exhausted quicker, and by, say, six minutes, they had given up. So it's interesting to see what the implications of all this are, and they actually found that there are uh, certain parts of the brain and certain circuits where calcium is involved and a number of other chemicals are involved that we don't have time to get into this episode. But I find it fascinating that we keep using these zebrafish and that they keep telling us so much about what it is to be human, even though they're so different and our experiences are so completely alien to one another. I mean, in some ways, they're so much better at certain things, like judging distance than we are with their eyes closed. They can tell how far they've swam and get a treat and do that over and over and over on a mark, and they're within 5% of where they should be. We're within 50% of where we should be. So if we're, if we're walking and we were told to walk 20 feet, we may be 10 feet, we may be 30 feet, and say, okay, I'm there, uh, give me my treat now. <clears throat> or give me my hundred bucks or whatever the study did. So it's pretty amazing to look at these fish and you think, oh, they're simple. They don't have complex emotions and all these things, but they can still teach us a lot. And some of the systems that they rely on for survival are some of the same systems that we've uh, turned into more complex, yet still essentially the same, uh, chemically speaking, uh, systems for very, very complex feelings, emotions, and actions. And it's important to remember to study the little things and to study where we came from because we all are all related after all.